This is a Dell Precision M6400. At first glance, an ordinary looking business machine, but it has a very special CPU inside. To find out why that is, we first need to go back in time by about 12 years. With the introduction of the Intel Clarksfield Core i7 line of mobile processors back in 2009, Intel brought quad core laptops to the mainstream with cheaper variants like the 720QM and 740QM finding their way into a ton of media, gaming and business machines. However, the Clarksdale Core i7s weren't the first quad-core laptop CPUs. Intel was the first to ship a quad-core desktop CPU all the way back in 2006 with their Kensfield Core 2 quad processors. And while these were light years ahead of NetBurst in terms of efficiency, they still consumed a fair bit of power. About a year later Intel updated their Core 2 Quad lineup with Yorkfield, which now had two Penrin dies, and these new chips included quite some rework to the old Conroe architecture, and had a note shrink to the more efficient 45 nanometer process, which now used high K gate oxide and metal gates. And with this they were now able to improve efficiency enough where they could select a very few high quality chips for use in laptops, and they made three models. Starting with the Core 2 Quad Q9000, a 2 GHz quad core with 6 MB of L2 cache. Then the Core 2 Quad Q9100, with a clock speed of 2.26 GHz and 12 MB of L2 cache. And lastly, bring us back to the precision. In its base configuration it had a 2.26 GHz Core 2 Duo P8400, but for an extra $890 over base price you could get the Core 2 Extreme QX9300. And this was the cream of the crop, a fully unlocked 2.53 GHz Core 2 Quad with 12 MB of L2 cache in a laptop, and that is what this machine came equipped with. Let's first have a look at the CPU, then at the features of this machine, then Windows performance and gaming, and finally overclocking. Yes, we can overclock this business workstation laptop. To look at the CPU, we'll go from this to this. And after some disassembly, we find the QX9300. Now what's cool about these Core 2 Quad Mobile chips is that they don't have a heat spreader, like the regular desktop versions so we can see the two dual-core dies in all their glory. Removing the CPU, we can also see that, unlike the desktop chips, this is a PGA CPU, namely MPGA479, with pins at the underside of the package. Now what made it so expensive is that Intel had to cherry-pick dies that could run at a high frequency, in this case 2.53 GHz, but use way less power with all the Core 2 Quad Mobile chips having a TDP of only 45 watts, compared to 65 all the way to 150 for the desktop parts. A little further up there is Intel's Q43 chipset, which in this case is configured to use DDR3 memory. Now laptops with Core 2 and DDR3 were rather uncommon back in 2008, and this machine has 4 sticks of 2GB DDR3-1033. For the GPU this machine was configured with the base NVIDIA Quadro FX 2700M. It's based on the Tesla architecture and has 48 CUDA cores with a clock speed of 530 MHz. It's about equal to the desktop GeForce 9600GS. There was an upgrade option possible to the more potent FX 3700M, which was roughly equal to the desktop GTS 250. And with that, let's get everything back together again. Back in 2008 the M6400 was truly at the top of Dell's range, a massive 17 inch mobile workstation with the best mobile hardware on offer at the time. You could say as high end as Dell's best Alienware machines, but designed to meet the durability standards for business use cases. From the I.O. we can see that this machine is from another era with PC card, Firewire, VGA and full size DisplayPort. Opening it up we find a clue that it has something special, a black Intel Core 2 Extreme sticker. Moving on we find a full backlit QWERTY keyboard, smart card reader, fingerprint sensor and a webcam. 
And then there's the unique jog shuttle trackpad. Tap on the left bottom corner and it lights up. It's meant to mimic the video editing control panels. And unfortunately it only supports a few older programs, but we can see it working here in the Windows Media Player, scrolling through the tracks. As for the display, it's a 17-inch 1920 by 1200 Fantastic for productivity, and despite its age, it actually looks really good. And this was only the standard CCFL backlit variant, with a more expensive RGB backlit version on offer still. And to power it all, there's this enormous 210 watt power adapter. As you've probably seen, we're running Windows 7, the professional version, 64-bit of course. Here's the CPU Z information, and as you can see, it'll boost just shy of 2.8 GHz under light loads. Under a sustained multi-core load, all cores run at 2.53 GHz, and the cooling does a fantastic job, keeping it under 70 degrees centigrade. As for the GPU info, here's the FX2700M, with 48 CUDA cores, 512 MB of GDDR3, and a TDP of 65 watts. At idle in the Windows desktop, the entire system consumes around 35 to 45 watts. And under load here, running GTA 5, this rises to around 100 to 120 watts. I picked this machine up about a year ago, and I've used it quite a bit since then. And what's mostly struck me is just how snappy and usable it still is for, well, everyday tasks. Considering the age of the machine, I've done a bit of writing and watched some YouTube on it. 1080p60 on the uh, VP9 and AVC codecs will still play, although AVC does struggle when you're not full screen. But still, 12 years old this machine is, and with 8GB of RAM you still have plenty of room for multitasking, and the upgrade option to 16GB is still open. Let's get the benchmarks. Here I've benchmarked a few other dual core chips for comparison. A 35 watt TDP Core 2 Duo T9550, a newer Sandy Bridge i5 2520M, also 35 watt, and an even more modern 15 watt Skylake based i5 6200U. Starting with Cinebench R15, the QX9300 is still competitive in multi thread. It's nearly twice as fast as the Core 2 Duo, and it beats the i5 2520M by 7%. However, the Skylake i5 is 8% faster here. In single thread, however, it loses by 34 and 54% compared to Sandy Bridge and the Skylake i5 respectively. Results are similar in the multi-threaded Povray, where the Skylake i5 is 8% faster, but the QX9300 beats the i5-2520M by 18%, with the T9550 at nearly half the points. Next up is the Octane 2.0 JavaScript benchmark, and here the more modern architectures really shine with the i5-2520M beating the QX9300 by 47%, and the 15 watt i5-6200U beating it by 88%. Compared to the T9550, the extra cores have little effect here. We see the same pattern in the speedometer web app responsiveness benchmark. Here the Sandy Bridge i5 is 18% faster, and the Skylake i5-6200U is 57% faster than the Core 2 Quad. The T9550 is also close to the QX9300 here. And lastly we have Ycruncher, a multi-threaded app that computes Pi. The results are fascinating here, with the QX9300 being nearly twice as fast as the T9550, and the i5-2520M is only 2% ahead. However, the Skylake-based i5-6200U absolutely screams ahead here, being twice as fast as the Sandy Bridge i5, and the Penrin Core 2 Quad. And we of course must play some games on it. Starting with GTA 5, it can run it at 1280x800 with the normal settings, with FPS ranging from around 20 to 30 FPS. I'd say you could play this on this machine. Moving on to good old Minecraft, running at the full 1920 by 1200 with fancy graphics and 12 chunks render distance, and it runs fantastic on this machine, running between 50 to 70 FPS, with some occasional stutter but nothing too bad. Next up is Mafia 2, running also at the full 1920 by 1200 with the low settings, 
and here it runs between around 24 to 30 FPS, but with decent frame times, making it actually somewhat playable. And finally, Counter-Strike Global Offensive at 1280x800 with the very low settings. FPS is a mixed bag here between 35 to 70 FPS with very inconsistent frame times. Nevertheless, it does run on this machine. And for a synthetic benchmark, here is 3D Mark Cloudgate. And now for overclocking, because yes, you can overclock this machine, even though it certainly wasn't meant to do so and it can't be done via the BIOS, which doesn't offer any manual controls. But instead we can do so via an application called Throttle Stop by Kevin Glynn. And with this we can adjust the voltage and multiplier as this is an unlocked CPU. And it's really easy to use, just press unlock and turn on and from there set the multiplier and off we go. Increasing the multiplier by 1, we're now at 11.5 for a clock speed of just over 3 GHz. Now one more at 12, 3.19 GHz. Just moving the mouse around to see if the system is still stable. 12.5, 3.32 GHz. 13, 3.46 GHz, still going. 13.5, now at nearly 3.6 GHz. 14, 3.73 GHz. And that's where it went. I did try increase the voltage just a little bit to 1.3 volts to see if that would give us even more headroom, but we got the same result, 3.72 GHz maximum, which is really amazing. We're talking a gigahertz over stock speed, even if it isn't 24-7 stable. And for that I did some more testing and found that at 1.275 volts I would get an all-core overclock of 3.46 gigahertz. And in Cinebench R15 that got that able to pass and a score of 373 points. It's nearly 33% higher than stock now easily overtaking the Skylake i5-6200U. Really an absolutely phenomenal overclock for a laptop. These Core 2 Quad mobile chips certainly weren't common and back in 2008 many applications were still not optimized to take advantage of more than two cores. So in many cases you're better off spending less by opting for a higher clocked Core 2 Duo instead. So that's why I'd say that not many machines were configured with these chips. So I was quite happy to finally find one of these machines with the elusive Unlocked Extreme Edition. In terms of performance we saw that in certain multi-threaded applications it can still keep up quite well with more modern dual-core chips with hyper-threading, albeit at a much higher power draw. And also that in other applications there is simply no getting around the age of the core architecture now. Although you could certainly make up a bit of that by overclocking if you really wanted to throw all common sense out of the window. It was fun though. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you have a like would be very much appreciated and if you want to be kept up to date on future videos, why not consider subscribing and enabling the bell notifications. I'm curious to know your comments on these Core 2 Duo and Core 2 Quad Mobile chips. Please do leave them below. Or you can reach me on Twitter, also via the links below. Well, that was all for now and bye bye.